Let's talk a little bit about the relationship between U.S. slavery and the rise of capitalism. Now, it might surprise some people that we're going to talk about those two things together because typically historians and economists and politicians and reformers and all sorts of other people have said that these two things are opposites. Slavery and capitalism are not the same thing at all. And to a large extent, that's been because they identify the rise of capitalism with the rise of wage labor. And slavery is certainly not wage labor. That's part of the definition of slavery, that enslaved people were not paid for their labor. In fact, they were treated as property. But, in fact, what we see when we look at the history is that slavery in the United States, and especially its expansion during the early 1800s, is absolutely crucial to the rise of capitalism, to the Industrial Revolution, and to the escape of Western societies, including the United States, from the Malthusian trap of agricultural society. Because slavery as an institution attempted to dehumanize people, it's really helpful when talking about the history of slavery to actually look at individual human beings' lives so we can understand what their choices and experiences were like at the individual level, but also how we can see how the system worked. Because when we understand it at the micro level, we're going to understand it much more effectively at the macro level. So let's look at one such story, the story of a man named Charles Ball. And we know his story because eventually he was able to tell his story, but more about that later. Let's look at how he grew up in the 1780s and 1790s in Maryland. At this point, Maryland, which had been a tobacco colony before independence, was in an economic decline, and especially the plantation society within Maryland's tobacco counties was in decline. The crop brought planters much less money, uh, labor was less prof profitable, soil was less fertile. Now, this is the picture that many opponents of the slave trade said we should see. We should see slavery as an institution that was not part of the modern world and was in decline. And many of them predicted that after the closing of the Atlantic slave trade, which of course happens in 1807, the decline of slavery plus the fact that the importation of slaves from Africa had ended would mean that within a generation or so there would be no more slavery. That's not what Charles Ball actually experienced. Because slavery in Maryland was declining, new opportunities opened for individuals like Charles Ball. And as a young man, he tried to seize them. He found ways to do extra work. Uh, he knew that if he earned enough money, he'd probably be able to buy his freedom from his owner, who, after all, wasn't gaining much profit from the labor of his slaves anymore. Soon he married, he had children, and he could see a future in which they would all be free. But all of that ended one spring day in 1805. He'd been sent by his owner to take a cartload of goods down to a small town along the Patuxent River. When he was there, as he was unloading the cart, he suddenly noticed he was surrounded by white men. And two of them grabbed him and quickly tied his hands behind his back. And another white man jumped in front of him and said, you are now my slave and I'm taking you to Georgia. What had happened was that Charles Ball had been sold by his owner to a slave trader. And the slave trader, or Georgia man, as he was called uh, typically by enslaved people and others in Maryland at the time, marched him down to the riverside and locked him in a chain that linked 49 other men together. So he was literally part of what was called a, a coffle, a chain uh, of enslaved men that was going to be marched to Georgia. Now, his feet weren't chained. He could move his feet, but his arms were chained to the people next to him. His neck uh, had an iron collar, and there was a long chain that went through a ring on each man's collar to bind them all together. Like that, they could do nothing except walk. They couldn't resist slavery. Uh, they couldn't resist what was happening to them. And they were, in fact, forced to walk something like 500 miles south, all the way to Columbia, South Carolina where he was sold to a man named Wade Hampton. Wade Hampton, who was in fact one of the richest men in the United States at the time. And Wade Hampton took him the next day, after the day of sale, to his plantation near Columbia. And that's where Charles Ball found out that slavery was not in fact decaying, slavery was in fact expanding. When Charles Ball got to Wade Hampton's plantation, it was late in the afternoon, and Hampton to go, told him to go work in the garden for the rest of the day. And as he was pulling weeds, 
and darkness was starting to fall, he heard a large group of people coming past the garden. He walked out and he saw it was over 200 slaves returning from the cotton fields. Charles Ball knew that he wasn't alone. But what he was in the process of discovering was exactly how many other people had gone through, were going through, or were about to go through exactly what he was going through. That's the forced migration from the northern part of the South, the older plantation states, to the newer frontiers of slavery. In fact, Ball and those other 200 people on Wade Hampton's plantation were just a drop in a flood. By 1810, remember this is 1805, by 1810 about 50,000 people had already been moved to South Carolina and Georgia, which were the first cotton frontier. Over the next 50 years or so, as the cotton frontier moved south and west, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, eventually all the way through Texas, about one million enslaved people would make the same journey that Ball had done. And the majority of them, like Ball, would be moved by slave traders, many of them marching in chains, just as he did, some even further distances. And what they went through emotionally, uh, personally, uh, was a tremendous dislocation, as you can surely imagine. Ball thought he would never see his wife again, he would never see his children again. All the way south, when he lay there in chains, he would dream of his children, and when he woke up, he would think of suicide. Now, he didn't do it. We know other people did. Uh, one Sunday when he was exploring in the woods by his new home, he actually found the body of someone who had. But this was a tremendously dislocating experience, and it was very, very difficult for people to survive on, on that sort of level. But the, the emotional, psychological side was only one piece of it. There was a physical dimension as well. Something Ball began to get a hint of when he saw what his new companions looked like. They had fewer clothes than slaves wore in Maryland. Their skin looked less healthy. They were thinner. Uh, children who were younger uh, than had been the practice in Maryland were being sent out to the fields. And they lived in a part of the country where disease was, was much more dangerous and much more deadly. So he would have to survive all of that. But that wasn't even the worst part of it. And we'll get to that in a second. The next morning when Ball, for the first time, was driven out to the cotton fields of South Carolina, he saw and he experienced a kind of labor that was qualitatively different than what he had experienced in Maryland. Now, slavery in the older southern states or in the Caribbean was exploitative and the labor was harsh. But what would happen on the cotton frontier was qualitatively different. And it would only become more and more exploitative as time went on. Now, this isn't what had been predicted by the visionaries who dominate the late 18th century in our imaginations. People like Thomas Jefferson or the French revolutionaries or English romantics uh, who are excited by the possibilities of change, who think that the world is going to become a better place, a place in which human beings have more choice, a place in which economic improvements bring qualitative improvements to all people, including a reduction of boring and painful uh, and brutalized labor. That is simply not what Charles Ball and one million other enslaved people, in fact more than a million other enslaved people in the United States, were about to experience in the course of the expansion of cotton. And yet, ironically, what they experienced was a crucial part of the industrialization that made the modern world actually come into being.